Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Aaron Lutz and I'm the campus pastor at our East 96 campus. You know, Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad you have joined us online to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe life is better when we do it together. When we, when we gather as a church, we say often that it's this non-downloadable experience. I mean, singing together and praying together and, and serving each other. Those are things that just don't translate online, but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so I'd encourage you and make plans to check out the campus nearest to you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us online at clearcreek.org to find more information about our locations, our service times, and a whole lot more. We hope to see you soon. If you didn't recognize any one of those bands or singers, you can leave now. <clears throat> for the record, we tried to find intentionally a band for every decade uh, and so that everyone could be represented. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, anything from Bruce's generation, our lead pastor, Bruce Wesley. Uh, television hadn't been invented yet. Edison would come into this world a few years after that. So uh, if he's not here, he's never going to hear this. Is he here today? Um, <clears throat> listen, ever been to a concert where the lead vocalist pulls away, pulls out of it, and all you do, just like what you saw there with either Coldplay or Pearl Jam or U2, so on and so forth, where you guys just start singing just by a show of hands. Anyone ever been like that? Ever had that place at a concert? I just want to see who's ever been to a concert. I mean, um, we... I've seen that. We had Cody Johnson uh, singing at um, the rodeo, and he did one of those songs where everyone's singing along, and he just drops out, and it's like, I mean, it's NRG Stadium. It's packed. It's full. And those kind of experiences, <clears throat> they're, they're kind of magical. They're emotional. They're physical. And sometimes, depending on the song, especially with you two, they might even be spiritual experiences. And it's because music, uh, music and songs and singing, they're just... It's just a powerful tool. It's got a whole arsenal within it. It's got sound and lyrics and rhythm and melody, a tune, that whole. They put all that stuff together, coalesce those forces, and it has a direct impact on us, not just in how we think, but also how we, how we feel. Like if I were to hum, I'm not going to do it, <clears throat> but if I were to hum like the tune of a famous song, you guys could know what the lyrics are to that song. And if I were to do the opposite, if I were to like... Tell you the words, oh, say, can you see by, dawn's, by the dawn's early light? I mean, if I just did that, and I just did, you, you can already hear the tune in your head. In fact, how many of you have ever had this experience? You hear a, ra a song on the radio you haven't heard in decades, and all of a sudden you can just sing along with it like it was nothing. That's the power behind music and how it interacts with people called human beings. It hits us in our psyche. It hits us in our pathos, our emotions. It actually even messes with us, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, physically. Think about this. I don't know how many of you guys work out. As you can tell, I work out a lot. Um, but if you go, I don't know why you're laughing. Uh, but I, I tell you this, if you ever go to like LA Fitness or Planet Fitness or your local gym somewhere else, half the people, maybe more that are working out, are listening to music in their AirPods and their earbuds. And if you could probably take out those earbuds <clears throat> and listen along, my assumption is that most of that music is going to be the high-end energy kind of music. They're going to be listening to like EDM, electronic dance music, for those of you who don't know. Uh, they're going to listen to rock music. They're going to listen to something that's either high energy or something that has a really good beat, strong beat to work out by. Or maybe even uh, a lot of people like to listen to like angry music, angst-ridden songs because it puts a certain uh, oomph in their workout. Like you're never, no one's ever benching 250 to like Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. You know, it's just not going to happen, right? You can't live five pounds if you listen to that, much less 250. How many of you have even like <clears throat> driven down at the stoplight here on 528 or wherever, and you turn around, and someone's in their car, and they're just, arms are gyrating, they're bopping up and down, they're just shouting out loud, and it doesn't bother you at all because you know that like, they're not demon-possessed. You're like, that's not a possession. I don't think that's possession. What are they doing? They're just jamming out to one of the favorite songs that they heard on the radio. But here's what happens. Notice this. When you listen to music and it's something that you like, you can't sit still. If, I mean, if you have a heartbeat, if you have a thing called the soul, it usually happens like when you hear something that you like, 
Whether for those of you like to hear a big strong beat, your head starts bobbing up and down, or if it's your favorite song, you sing along. If it's a happy song and you feel in a happy mood, oh, it's perfect, oh, that's great, right? But if it's a sad song and you feel happy, like, no, that, that song's horrible, change that song. But if you're sad, you want to hear that song. Why, why is that? Am I sad? I'm going to listen to some more Celine Dion. If I'm happy, <clears throat> I'm going to listen to these kinds of songs. And if I'm kind of melancholic, I'm just going to go in between. It's just music has an incredibly big impact on us. It not only affects us, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, uh, emotionally and mentally, it affects us physically. It's a unique kind of phenomenon where head and heart and body, they all come together. Uh, and now someone might go, oh, Yancey's setting us up, man. He's setting us up. Are you going to say like music's bad? No. I mean, bro country is, but outside of that, <laughs> everything else is good. Uh, I, I, I think... God, when you look at the scriptures, especially in the first few chapters of Genesis, <clears throat> God created music. It's a gift from him. And here's what I'm going to do, to do today. I want to show you all how uh, this gift of music that God gives us can be a very means of grace for followers of Jesus who uh, live in a world where they can uh, easily forget who they are and what they're about. Last week, as we already mentioned, we began a new series called Restoried, whereby we're talking about the one true story of God that starts off in creation, and it moves through the fall, and it goes on, as you can see here in the screens, to redemption, <clears throat> and ultimately to the new creation that we have in Christ, where Christ returns and brings us the fullness of his kingdom in a world without end. Now, that, that what we talked about last week, <clears throat> that one true story, excuse me, <clears throat> that one true story is uh, the, the story that not only tells us about how history will go, is it tells us the story about who you are and who I am, who we are as a people, who God is as God, what we're called to do, the type of people we're called to be, the kind of values we're supposed to have. Everything gets defined by the one true story. And that kind of story shapes us and it forms us over time into being the kind of people that Jesus died for at the cross. And it's the kind of story that gives you peace when you're despairing, <clears throat> that gives you hope uh, when, when you're needed something to hold on to. It's the kind of story that gives you confidence when doubts start to like nip at your heels. That's the kind of power it is when you find yourself square within the story of God. But far too often the problem is, is that our world pushes all kinds of alternative stories for you to believe in. Like, it, it, like, like your business is the most important thing. Or where you live is the most important thing. Or, or your family, as good as they are, they're the most important thing. Or money's the most important thing. Like there's some kind of <clears throat> alternate story that the world's gotten a hold of, and it's trying to, it, and, and you're trying to buy into it because it wants you to buy into it. But once you buy into that story, once you find yourself in those alternate storylines, what often happens is now that defines your identity. Now that defines your security. Now that defines your worth. And all of a sudden, your values look a whole lot different <clears throat> than the kingdom of God's. And it's this slow burn over time because you found yourself in a different story. That's the power of story. And what does this have to do with music? I'm going to show you. But far too often, followers of Jesus forget the real story that they're in. And so they lose sight of that. And they start to see all these kind of alternative storylines creep into the nooks and crannies of their heart. And then it determines how they think. It determines how they feel. and determines what they do. That's why we're called to be reminded of the story. Like every time that we gather here, uh, one of the things that happens is that we're supposed to be restoried <clears throat> to... Um, to be reframed and reshaped into the people of God that God has called us to be, that Jesus has died for us so that we might regain an idea of what our aims and our hopes and our goals are in the person of Jesus. In short, we, we need to come here to be restored. And the beautiful part of all this is, is that God gave us uh, a, a great gift in coming together in corporate worship, not just because you and I show up and we sit down, but because there are movements within the service and every service that we have every week and really not just our church, but churches all around the world, where we have these practices that restore us back into the story of God if we're intentional about it. Like you can come and sit down, and then when I'm done, you can get up and leave, so you can get in your car and beat everyone else to lunch. You can do all that stuff, but you're missing out on what it is to be restored. Like, like when you understand the intentionality behind every one of the movements and these practices and what we call corporate worship, <clears throat> and you see the power behind it, 
It changes everything. It changes how you engage. It changes how you prepare. It changes how you even listen to this message. And so here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to highlight one of the things that we do in our services. Today, I want to talk to you about corporate singing. What? Corporate singing? No way, Yancey. I don't even sing very well. I know. We all know that too. But <clears throat> it's not about how well you sing. Uh, I don't sing very well either. I want to show you why corporate singing, when we come together, why, how, and um, and why it's such a big deal, I should say. I'm going to get caught up in my own thoughts here. I want to do is this. <clears throat> I want to take you to a passage. In order to show you the power behind when we come together to worship, to sing, and how it restores us, I want to take you to Colossians, the book of Colossians. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can open it up or you can uh, turn it on your phone to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at one verse, but I, I need to set it up to give it its proper context. We're going to look at Colossians 3.16 in one second. <clears throat> the, the context of Colossians 3 is Paul is writing the Christians in Colossae and he's trying to share with them specifically in chapter 3 that there's been this new shift in the trajectory of their lives. Now that they've become followers of Jesus, <clears throat> there's, a, um, there's been a tectonic change in their lives. Like all the things that they were living for, they're not living for anymore. Now they're living under the uh, tutelage of the king of all creation, Jesus the Christ. Like they're, they're living for him and now that he's now that, that that's happened, he's trying to share with them, like, man, now that you've received the gospel, let me tell you how that ought to impact your life. And so the first couple of verses I want to show with you, I want to show you before we get into verse 16. It says in verse 2 and 3, it says this of chapter, uh, chapter 3. <clears throat> Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for, your, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in uh, at Christ in God. Fr frankly, that's my, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible is verse 3. For you have died, you Christian have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now we might rephrase that for the intents and purposes of our sermon today. We might say like, fix your eyes. Paul's telling the Colossian Christians, fix your eyes upon the true story instead of falling for these alternative, weak, lesser, worldly tales that the world wants you to suck up and believe and believe this is all about you. No, no, no. Your life is tied up into a better story and it's hidden with Christ and God. Now, Paul's going to spend the bulk of this chapter, the rest of it, talking about what their life should look like in light of the grand story that they find themselves in. In verses 5 through 10, he talks about behaviors that they shouldn't do that don't fit the storyline. And in verses 11 through 17, he talks about behaviors that do fit that storyline. Like when, you, when you've been restoried, this is what your life should look like. And then he does something very interesting. In verse 16, <clears throat> he highlights a command that includes, of all things, it includes music. It includes singing. Hmm? Really? Yeah, let's look at it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And here's what it says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, in hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is the second word from the, the, sec the first line, the second to the last word, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's not singular. He's not talking to you as an individual. He's talking to the church at Colossae. He's like, let the word of Christ dwell in the church at Colossae Richly, in other words, what he's trying to, what I want to highlight that for is this: he's talking to the community of faith as a community of faith. Far too often we read a Bible, we think it's just me and Jesus, but that's not, like ninety-nine percent of the uh, New Testament was written to the plural you. Then remember, Texans, we get this. We've talked about this before. Let the word of Christ dwell in y'all richly. Y'all, we have a plural you word. We ought to, it's, it's great. Jesus must have been a Texan because that's what he's thinking about here with through Paul. Let the word of Christ dwell in you all richly. So we're just supposed to do this. How do we do that together? Well, primarily what scholars think about this is that the chief place that happens is within the weekly gathered worship service. That makes sense because here's what we see them do. What are we to do? Again, stick with the first line. Let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Well, what's the word of Christ? Well, that's simple. That's the message of the gospel. That's the tale that we just talked about. It's the tale that begins with creation, then the fall because of sin, then redemption in Jesus, and ultimately the new creation or the consummation or the restoration of all things when all things are made new. That's the one true story, right? That in sum is what we're all to be about. Now it says here that we're to gather, if you see the screen here, we're to gather here and uh, be richly within the story of Jesus whenever we come together. Well, how does that happen? <clears throat> I like the word richly, by the way. 
So what that tells us is that when you come, you shouldn't just have this surface attention to Jesus and his kingdom. Like, you should come together, you all, we all should come together in such a way that when we leave, that Jesus' story, who he is and what he's done, and what's happening in creation all the way to the end where there's restoration and new consummation and new heavens and new earth, like, that should dwell deeply within us. Now, the reason I think Paul says that, at least one reason, that it, got, it has to penetrate every nook and cranny of our being, is because if it doesn't do that, something else will fill the gap. Like, you guys will leave this place, you've been here for maybe an hour and ten minutes, and then for the rest of your week, whatever narratives are out there are going to be assaulting you. Like, this is what you need to believe, and this is what you need to be about. And so you'll see it, and tweet it, and flip through it, and TikTok it, whatever. Those are the alternative storylines. And we start to believe those things. And so what Paul is trying to warn the Colossians Colossians about is this. Hey, listen, Colossian Christians, y'all, when you get together. Let the story of God that we talk about every week, let it go deep in you. Because if it doesn't, something else is going to fill the cracks. And those other stories, listen, will de-story you from the one true story of God. And it de-stories you by coupling, or I should say decoupling you from the values and the goals and the vision that God has for each one of us within his kingdom. Now, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Oh, that means heart penetration, right? So... How does that happen when we gather? Well, look back at the text. Paul says it happens by this. It says, by teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, that's likely because uh, we hear the word of God being taught, like I'm doing right now. We open up the Bible, and we uh, are, are taught and admonished. So we have the woos and the warnings of Scripture. And we'll talk about what the sermon does in a message, how it restores us in a later message and ironic well, to have a sermon about the sermon, but nevertheless. <clears throat> but here's what the apostle does here. He says the second activity, when the church gathers in order to restore ourselves back to God and back to his story, is not just in teaching and admonishing, but through, listen this, this last phrase here, through singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts with God. By the way, that grouping, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, scholars just simply believe that these are the different types of songs that the early nascent church would have sung when they came together every week on Sundays, what they would call the Lord's Day. They would would sing psalms, uh, which probably they sang out of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, which simply means songs. They sang hymns and spiritual songs. Now, here's what I think is kind of cool when you look at this text. There are some scholars out there, very well-respected scholars, that believe that singing and teaching here are actually connected. Let me me tell you what I mean by that. Here's how they would read this text. They'd say, uh, the word of Christ should dwell within the church richly. Here's how it does it. It dwells within you richly because you're getting teaching and admonishing, not just from a sermon, but, but you're actually getting teaching and admonishing through the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Like there's something about, like the music that you sing about, that's actually teaching you and admonishing you, helping you grow all the more deeply and more richly in Jesus Christ. In other words, there's something about the songs and the singing that restore us. Now, I don't, I don't think it really matters if you take that view on that interpretation or one that says, no, that's really about the sermon, this is really about the songs. Because in the end, it's all under the umbrella. This is how the word of Christ dwells richly in us. So here's kind of like, neither option that you take, here's the truth about it all. We'll put it on the screen for you. It's this. Corporate singing in worship is a means of grace by which God can restore us every week. I just want to sit with you guys for that for a second. Because far too often singing gets like on the Bunsen burner of what people think about when they come to a church service. For some people, it's like the warm-up act. It's like, I don't really sing, everyone else can sing, this is my time to drink my coffee and just wait for the guy to come up and preach. Or it's kind of like the thing, like, it's the conclusion of when I need to get out to my car and beat everyone else out. Because when the sermon's done, the the music's my exit music. And I want to go beyond all that, I want to push you beyond that and help you understand that corporate singing worship is a gift. It's a gift actually, not just to God, but it's actually God's gift back to us because it's a means of grace by which God can restore us each week. And here's why. As you reflect on the power of music, it makes sense why Paul tells the Colossians, hey, listen, man, you need to be restoried into the one true story. You need to let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. And let me tell you one of the ways that happens. It happens when you come together and you sing to God. 
and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And the reason that that makes sense that he would even talk about that it's not because he's a Rhodes Scholar. It's because he's a human being that understands that music's a gift of God. Because think about what music does. Music not only hits us in our mind with lyrics that we read, it also hits our heart in a way that, that just, you know, me talking doesn't do. It moves us. Music's intentionally emotional. That's why they put soundtracks to, 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 to movies. And so that it matches the emotion of the moment. You don't see some kind of... Uh, King Kong stepping on people, and they're playing like, you know, they're doing work. You know why? Because it doesn't match the emotion of the moment. No, you you, you pay Hans Zimmer a billion dollars to have some really cool track that they're going to sell on Spotify later. Because music makes a difference. So Paul understands that. God made it. So here we have this... This gift that God gives everyone, but especially for the church, we have a gift that impacts our mind, that impacts our emotions, that actually can impact our bodies. So that we might, once again, not just know what it's like to be in the story, but feel, once again, how those truths of the story should make us have a heartbeat that's fast, or uh, makes us cry when we need to, or lets us jump up for joy, or raise our hands, or bow in prayer. I mean, that is the power behind music. It's not magic. But it's a gift that God uses of grace to restore us back to him. Let me just give you some illustrations of how that would be the case. So I'll just use me as an example. So at the start of this past year in January, you all remember what book we studied? Two people. God bless you. Um, (laughs) Glad it was so impactful. We did 12 weeks of it. It's a little book called Revelation. Yeah, that's okay. You can talk when I ask a question. Just give the right answer. Um, (laughs) So we went through, and I, 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 I and all, our teaching team, we preached through Revelation. It was like one of the best series I think we've done in a long time. It was awesome. It was great. I shouldn't say it like that because I was the one that preached most of that stuff for a year. But I really liked it. I really liked it. And one of the reasons I liked it was, forget you guys, I liked it for me. Um, I liked it because I felt like it grew me spiritually in ways that I hadn't grown in a long time. I was so deeply indebted to it. But there was this one time we're, we're, we're in worship service together, and I'm preaching through Revelation 5. Now, Revelation 5, don't turn there because I won't want to leave. Um, in Revelation 5, you have uh, this John the Revelator, the author, now turns his attention from heaven to earth. Excuse me, from earth to heaven. He looks up into the heavens, sees God on his throne. It's majestic, and all the angels and celestial beings are worshiping uh, God the Father. It's this amazing scene. And then, then there's this, uh, this book which is sealed up, which is the books of judgment. Like, how will God's justice reign on the land after injustice has happened? And no one can open it. Y'all remember this? No one can open it. And so uh, John's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Woe is us. And one of the elders around the throne says, chill out. doesn't say exactly that, but it's my paraphrase. Chill out, John. There is one who has come who can break the seals. And uh, it's the lion of Judah. You turn around, you think it's a lion. It's this lamb. It says this lamb was there uh, standing, but as if was slain. So we know it's Jesus. And then it says Jesus essentially comes up to the Father like, I can take those seals. And he breaks them. In other words, that like he alone is worthy to break the seals of judgment. And then what happens in the scene of Revelation 5, it's just overwhelming. I remember studying this. I was just weeping going through this, going, oh, I don't even deserve to preach this message. Much less just read this text. But in the scene, after he breaks it, then all of a sudden heaven's like, oh, my gosh. No, only God can do that. So it's obviously that Jesus isn't just some dude. He's God in the flesh. And so what happens in this scene is this. They've been worshiping around the Father's throne in the heavens. And all of a sudden, when Jesus steps up, they start to worship Jesus the Lamb. And then it says here, it says that essentially all the praise of heaven. And they've been singing this. He is worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, who was and is and is to come. And it says all this stuff about worth language. And all of a sudden, they recognize the worthiness of Jesus in this. The way that it's described, it's as if the praise of heaven drips out into the earth and all the earth praises Jesus as well. It's just overwhelming. And I remember after preaching that sermon, we specifically had a song that we sing. We want to sing it today too. Called, Is He Worthy? It's a direct port from Revelation 5. And so we're, we're singing these kinds of lyrics. And they're very simple. We'll put it on the screen. Is, 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 the, the question is, is he worthy? And the response in song as well as this. He is. He, I won't even sing it because I won't mess it up. It just says, he is, he is, he is. And then it adds on the same thing that we see in Revelation 5. He is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. And I remember singing this song. I'm like, man, I just couldn't sit down. Like, you know, I took off my Baptist seatbelt, threw it away. I was gone. 
you know. I was like full Pentecostal, you know, knocking people out of the way. Like, I'm, he is, he, I mean, I was just gone. You know why? Because that moment, that song, not only captured the emotional impulse of Revelation 5, it actually used the, 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 the text in Revelation 5. So here's, what, here's how it restoried me. It didn't just say, Yancey, you're a part of this story. Oh, that's so cool. It was like 2,000 years ago with Jesus. I don't know when Jesus is coming back and he's worshiped in heaven. It's like, no, 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 bud. You're in it now. Like I wasn't just being restored. I was in the story with God's people in that moment. Like I'm joining in the celebration that goes on in heaven right then and there. And what it was telling me is like, Yancey, whatever you think your life's about, your family, your work, uh, your image, your education, whatever it is, it's not. Like it's all about Jesus. In the end, it all revolves around Jesus. When you die, no one's going to circle around you and put praise to you. We're going to do it to this guy named Jesus. And so for like, if there's anything in your life that's not revolving around Jesus, that's really not your life. That's what a song did. That's what a song did. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit uses the truth of a song to wreck shop in the echo chamber of my own heart. That's what he does with you as well. See, now I'm like looking around and not, I'm not just singing this. Everyone else is singing this. I'm like, oh my gosh. We are the ones who have been chosen out of the world to worship God now and to live for his kingdom because in the end, it's all about Jesus. And so let, it fall, the hev- let, let the worship fall from the heavens onto the earth and let's just join in. And for that moment, I got to. And I don't care. I've, been to, I've, I've seen you two. I've been to see Coldplay and a bunch of these other cats. I love them all. Ain't nothing touched what I experienced there in Revelation 5 with the people of God. That was, that was beyond anything I've experienced. That's the power of singing that restores us. But sometimes I don't come in here and leave hyped up because i am just been in front of God's throne room with his people. Sometimes I need to be ministered in my brokenness. Like sometimes I just blow it, right? Not sometimes, a lot, right? And so let me just tell you this. Like one of my favorite hymns is Come Thou Fount. I mean, you know, the, how many of you ever heard, Come Thou Fount of many blessings to my... It's just not that singy songy, but you know what I'm saying. So it's an old school hymn. And there's times, believe it or not, when I walk in and I worship with God's people and I feel a lot of guilt and shame. And by that I mean like I've screwed up, I've... I've sinned in a way that I'm embarrassed, or it's the same sin that's gotten me down. I'm just thinking, man, Jesus, I don't even deserve to be here. And I just, I just, I have alternate stories in my head about my worth and about who I am. And so sometimes I, I come here a little amiss. I'm, I'm kind of unmoored from the gospel in some real ways emotionally. And then, and then somehow, how they've done the songs for that week, they just threw in uh, Come Thou Fount. And so I, I, I read lyrics like this. <clears throat> it says, O to grace, how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. That's the, that's the line that usually gets me. And then the guy just keeps going down on this big truth. He says, uh, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Now that's an old school hymn, and I get ruined by it. I get ruined by by my wandering heart, because I feel like I have a wandering heart. And what I like about this is that he keeps going on. He doesn't go, well, let's just move on to something really happy. He's like, I get it. Prone to wander. Man, I sing that song, and like, there's times like, I'm, I'm singing that louder than the grace that I know is later on. I sing the part like, Lord, I am prone to wander. And I do feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And so like, these, these last two lines, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for like, like I don't even believe that sometimes. I'm like, God, can I, I just want you to move my heart towards that. All right, that's what I want to have happen. This song was written by Robert Robinson 260 years ago. And what that does to me when I know that, I'm like, gosh, some, some follower of Jesus 260 years ago wrote a song that he knew people would sing, and he's got enough guts, enough honesty to go, Lord, I, I prone to, I'm prone to wander from you, man, and to leave you. I'm like, man, that's the kind of realness I need here. And yet in this song, this very song, as much as it's a confession of my own wandering heart, it it. it it wraps me up with the goodness of God and the grace that he has. Notice what this next line will say. <clears throat> this is the chorus here. Come thou fount of every blessing. See, some of you right now even hear the tune in your head. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my 
heart. See, y'all can sing it. I can't do it all, though, so we'll just go. Uh, Tanner were here, or Kendra, they could do it. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Like, my heart's out of tune. We might say, my heart has been destoried into other kinds of stories. Restory my heart to know of your grace and to sing of its streams of mercy never ending. Uh, it's never ceasing, I should say. Call for songs of loudest praise. And I start thinking, there's the true story. So, like, I, I come and I hear the truth of the kingdom that I'm not hearing on CNN or Fox or any other channel, ESPN. I'm not talk radio. There, no one's doing that. And I wonder why my heart gets so messed up. Because there's a thousand stories that want your heart, that want to tell you how to live and what should be valuable to you. And then you come in here, it's just like a little outpost of God's kingdom, and you hear what the real story is about. And so for me, I come in here with feelings of guilt or shame, and I, I get restoried because I sing songs like this. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing of your grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs the loudest. Now I'm singing loud at the end. Right? I've probably thrown the belt buckle away anyhow or the seat belt and I'm, I'm up and gone. Because I'm getting restored in that moment. That's the power of when we come together to sing. It's not flippant. It's not sitting on your hands. It's not just a warm up and it's not the exit music. It's actually a means of grace if you want to make it a means of grace. But you've got to come to it by faith. I'll give you one last one here. One, one song that kind of messes me up even more. Uh, sometimes God uses corporate worship and the singing of corporate worship um, to, to just redirect our hearts and hopes because you have a lot of anxieties. you got a lot of fears. Uh, I do. There's more of a modern hymn. It's probably, I don't know, man, eight to ten years old now, but it just went to an instant classic because it felt old school, uh, written by a bunch of new school people. Uh, the Gettys, Keith and, I can't remember what her last name is, Keith and someone Getty. But nevertheless, I got to see them actually lead this song one time. I will do this. Clear because we're going to be doing this one. It's called In Christ Alone. So you've probably heard about it. Here's what the lyrics look like. Uh, it, it would say, in Christ alone my hope is found. But here's, here's how it st starts off, or at least one part of it. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. And then notice what I've underlined here. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Now let me tell you why that's important. If you come in going, gosh, I don't know if Jesus loves me today. I don't know if I've sinned so much that maybe I'm outside the kingdom. I don't even know if my salvation is even going to take. What happens is you, you start to believe a bunch of junk in your head that's not true to the scriptures. And so, I, and I don't know what other music you listen to. I'm kind of like an eclectic guy. I like all kinds of music, all kinds of music, except bro country, all kinds of music. But I don't get this until I come around the people of God and get to sing it with the people of God. Now, I can, I, can, I can play this on the Christian radio and my Christian Spotify list. It's not the same when you're with all God's people. And I'll tell you why later. But if you have fear or anxiety about your walk with Jesus, someone wrote a song just for you to think through that. No guilt in life. Yancey, I know you feel kind of uh, anxious and fearful, but listen, man, no fear in death. That's the power of Christ in you. Jesus commands your destiny. And when I, when I start to sing about no power of hell, no scheme of man, I can't even sometimes get the words out because I'm so moved by it. Because I want to believe that's true. And I know that's what God's word says. That's part of the story. See, once you get in the story by faith, you can't get out of it. Because God's keeping you there. You got in by grace. You stay by grace. You persevere by grace. And if you forget that, sometimes you need a song to remind you of the truth of the story, which is simply this. No one can pluck you from the hand of the Father once Jesus has put you in the hand of the Father. Period. Not even you. If it's real, you'll stick. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. And what happens is this. You come into a service with all kinds of emotions, and emotions will lie to you, y'all. They'll lie to you. It says the, the Bible teaches that the heart is uh, sick, it's desperately wicked. Some Brent translations say, in other words, like your emotions can lie to you. They're not truth. All your emotions are, no, you might truly feel them, but they may not be true. You might have a, a deep, true emotions about something false. What I love about coming into God's house, if you will, with his people, and singing songs about the kingdoms, I'm reminded emotionally what I'm supposed to really feel. Like what this does is it doesn't amplify my wrong emotions. It tells me what right emotions to feel and redirects me so I'll know how to feel the truths of God's kingdom. This is how you let the word of Christ dwell within you richly, y'all. That's just three songs. I could do 100 million of them. I know it's a little bit hyperbolic, but I feel like I could. 
Like this tells us like how to let the word of Christ dwell within us richly when it comes to music. This is being restored. And this is probably why Paul says at the end of this text, he says, let this be done with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And it happens in this room and in other campuses and in churches around the world every Sunday. And sometimes for other churches every Sunday and Wednesday. Got to throw Wednesday in it for us. So. so let me just end it this way. I want you to be challenged that the sermon's not a warm-up. And it's not exit music. It's a very important part of what we do. The Holy Spirit can use it to, 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 to use us together. In fact, let me go back to the text one last time. Notice what it says here. It says, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly, teaching and admonishing what? One another. Like this is an us thing. And fortunately, corporate worship gets, gets kind of relegated to personal preferences and tastes. And, if, and that, you know, I don't know. I don't like that song so much. Eh, they should play this. Like here's all you've become. You're not a congregant anymore. You're just a critic. That's not really good for your discipleship. Like, if you're just a critic, if you're just a consumer, it's hard to be a rich young ruler in a Jesus-filled world. We need to return to being congregants, to being part of the people of God. But you need to understand this. Like, I get it for some of you that can't carry a tune, and some of you guys and gals that don't like some of the songs because it's just not your favorite song. Listen, we're not, we're not Spotify. We're the people of Jesus. And here's what you need to know. Sometimes your singing is not for you. Sometimes there's some guy or gal that's so burdened by the shadow of the world that they're living in that they're sitting in this service and they don't even have the power to speak. They're so messed up, so burdened they can't even sing. you got to sing for them. And sometimes you got to sing to them. Because they're going to be sitting in here Listen to God's people sing of the truths that they so desperately need to believe that they don't even have the power to sing, but they can hear your voice. And if it's out of tune, it won't matter. Because they're going to be hearing things like, um, bind my wandering heart to thee. No power of hell can snatch you out of the Father's hands. Or simply, he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. Man. So, church, let's get restoried. Let's sing, not just because God commands it, not just because it ministers to us and to others around us, but because that's how the word of Christ dwells richly within us. It's how God restores us to the one true tale. So here's what I want us to do. The rest of the band's going to come out, and uh, we're going to have a time of uh, prayer and praise. And I'm going to call you guys to re-engage what it's like. Because some of you, like, you do this well, and you're great with it, and I just want to applaud you. Others of you, and I, I, I'm both and. Sometimes I just come in, and I'm like, Lord, I just need you to help me to even want to be a part of this. I got so much going on in my head. So sometimes, like one of the first songs that we're going to sing in this second part of our worship through song together is just simply acknowledging, like, sometimes, God, I, I come here, and I've, it's warm-up music or exit music. Like, even right now, people are like, oh, Yancey's going to, they're going to spotlight me when I get up and walk out. You are. We got a sniper in the book over here. <laughs> Uh, it's just a blow dart. Don't worry about it. We won't kill you. No, man. So Kendra and Tanner, Denise, everyone is going to lead you in this. I want you to hear the words of this song. And let it be your prayer. Let it be a prayer about how we worship. And maybe even confession. God, help me to be the kind of worshiper you want me to be through song. Let songs be a means of grace, Lord, to me. So let me pray for us briefly. And then after that, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. After we're done. Father, thank you for the goodness of Jesus. Thank you for bringing us into a one true story. And Lord, I just know it's easy for me to forget. But I love that I love that I love to come in here. I get to be with God's people at Clear Creek Community Church. And I get to worship you through song in a way that ministers to me more than I've ever ministered to you. And that's the grace of it all. I just, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even get it. We're here to worship and magnify you. And yet you use those very songs to you and for you. And you turn around and minister to us through them. What a good God that you are. So, Lord, I pray that you do that even now. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen.